Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books in Political Science, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Lemisa Abdelati from the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. Today, I'll be talking to Wendy Wong about her book, We the Data, Human Rights in the Digital Age, which was published by the MIT Press in 2023. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I wonder if you could begin the interview by just telling us a little bit about yourself. I'm a political science professor. I am at the University of British Columbia, and I'm also the principal's research chair here. Um, and I am an, I, I do international relations. Um, and so most of my career, I've studied global governance. I've looked at non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and I've been really interested in human rights. This book that we're talking about today is a little bit different, um, and we can talk a little bit more about why it came about, but it is definitely a different direction I'm headed in, and I'm really excited to to think about the role of technology and politics. Right. So, um, you know, uh, some of our listeners might know that you're, uh, you know, a very highly regarded scholar. You've obviously written award-winning books uh, previously. Um, but this book, as, as you mentioned, is maybe a little bit of a departure for you. Um, so how did the book come about? There are a couple of reasons it came about. And and so I was coming back from Matt Leave. I had two kids really closely together. And so, I, you know, there was a big kind of thinking gap in my career um, as I focused on the family. And I, I was just coming back from Matt Leave, totally unexpected at a conference, started talking to my undergraduate advisor, Steve Weber um, from Berkeley. And he was talking about AI and human rights. Um, and I just thought, wow, I, I don't know anything about AI. And I think I should because of the way you're, he was talking about rights in that context. And so I started reading about it and really getting excited and starting to think about it, but also realizing the limits of my knowledge and the limits of my ability to, to you know, learn a lot of the techniques, the tech, the technical computational skills that are required um, to be quote in AI. So I talk, you know, I started talking to people working in the in the industry, working as academics, working as non-academics. And it was really interesting to me. And then the pandemic hit. And I think that was actually, a, you know, for all of us, it was of course a massive challenge. So, you know, and, and but for me, what was really interesting about it kind of if I could separate myself a little bit and be outside of myself was watching me and everybody else I knew in our, in our profession going online for everything. And all of a sudden the things that I was thinking about with regard to AI. So um, the massive amounts of data about people, for example, what was just being, you know, exponent exponentially increased as everything we used to do in person went on Zoom, right? And, and this platform that collects data about facial recognition, about faces and also collects speech, you know, speech data. And I thought, wow, this is so interesting. Like the world has become even more datafied. And I think it made me really want to write a book about the politics and the, and the social effects of datafication of what we used to be called big data and also how AI is is so dependent on data, and yet that's something we don't talk about much, but has huge consequences for how we live our lives. So I think that's the sort of the longer version of how I came to this project. And I have to say, I learned so much. Um, I read widely and voraciously and made tons of mistakes that were corrected very gently by people <laughs> who I talked to. But also it was a lot of fun. Um, to write a book like this because it was both tied to my previous work and also a substantial departure from my area of expertise previously. Excellent. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this before uh, before I hit record, but you know, listeners should know that the result is, um, you know, this book that's uh, that's very, very rich, uh, and, uh, but also incredibly readable. Um, and so I, I highly uh, encourage uh, readers to, after listening to this conversation, to pick up a copy of this book for themselves. Um, Those are such high compliments, Lamis. To hear that some that your book is readable is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so uh, let's kind of d- dive into uh, some of the content here. So let's let's begin with data and this this concept of datafication. So what is datafication? So l- let me. I think to answer that more 
uh, in depth. Let me, so what are data is an important thing to establish, right? So a lot of social scientists, we work with data and I think we almost take it for granted that they come from people, number one, but also that we're, the, the collection, the data collection and creation process is very much integrated into our work. So data are simply, you know, the output of our systematic recording of things that we observe in the world. And so as researchers, as data creators or data collectors, we are engaged in the process of winnowing out what's important in the world and what's not. Like we make judgments all the time. I mean, thinking about IR, you know, what, what kind of organization am I looking at? Is this a war or is this not a war, right? These are questions we ask ourselves a lot. So data in and of itself is a very active, um, thing that doesn't exist in nature. Somebody, a person has to go out there and create data. So when we talk about datafication, what we're talking about is the conversion of what I would argue nearly every aspect of the human life at this point, either in terms of behavior or thought or you know feeling into digital data. So into data that can be understood by and, and analyzed by a computer. And so this is a this is sort of a more specific phenomenon, but I would say it's become extremely widespread because of um, the nature of digital data and what we can get out of uh, out of it. Thank you for that. Um, so w one of the things that you address sort of er early on in the, in the book is sort of the the value of thinking about datafication um from a political science perspective or from a, a political perspective so i wondered if you could comment on that a little bit one of the things i really noticed a lot when i first started reading in this uh field of artificial intelligence is the gap in understanding of politics and social phenomena um and i think that has greatly improved since i started on this project in 2019 but at the time it just felt like everyone talking about ai was expounding on its technical applications and then had this like really utopian vision of how AI was going to change the human experience fundamentally for the good or actually for like in, in a negative way, but also seemingly in awe of the technology um, that the machine would eventually subsume humanity, right? But at the same time, there was a sort of like admiration for the tech, the technical aspects of that. And I just found that really wanting it, like there was something wrong with that picture. And, you know, then people started talking about the discriminatory effects of AI. And I thought that was really good because AI is naturally a discriminatory app, uh, technology. It takes data and it makes categories. It's just by definition, discriminating against different types of data um, and different types of people, as it were, when the data come from people. And so, I thought there needed to be a, an explicitly political lens. So as I said before, I looked at global governance, I studied NGOs. These are, I was really interested in collective action at the global level. I still am. Like why it works sometimes, why it doesn't work other times. But it made, I, in, in the process of writing this book, and I think we can talk about this a little bit more, is that I realized the ideas around collective action, which I think we all know, you know, as this basic idea in political science, that the bigger your group, the harder it is for that collective group to act. And you need certain um, individuals who are very invested in getting the outcome to push, right? Otherwise, and you get lots of free riding. And so one of the big problems with collective action is, of course, trying to minimize free riding and get stuff done. And um, I realized that that's really hard in the age of datafication because what's happening now is that you know, all these data are being collected about the about our everyday lives, right? They're fundamentally, it's this data collection process is fundamentally changing the way we live in the sense that everything that we're doing and thinking fundamentally gets converted into some kind of data and uploaded to a server that we don't really know about what, what happens. But regardless, the way those data are eventually used is that, um, you know, they're pulled together and sorted into different categories by by algorithmic techniques. And those the way the algorithm sorts people into different collectives is different from very often the way we se select ourselves into collectives. So think about the, the collective identities we all have, right? We have race, ethnicity, religion, gender, you know, sexual orientation. Like we 
activities, right? Hobbies. We don't have to be so serious, but like, you know, I think we understand inherently that, you know, I work, I'm a golfer, I'm a parent, I'm a woman, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, um, you know, American and, and the collectives that are being made through AI are not like that. We don't actually self-identify perhaps in these categories. And some of the categories you see, and I talk about this in the book, are really kind of derogatory or at least have some sort of like, there's a there's a label that conveys a purpose. So if you look at some marketing, um, marketing materials, for example, there are people who are put into categories like value pack renters or gray volunteers. I mean, clearly these are you know, market-based. And so there's a reason why people are being sorted that way. But I don't know that many people would identify as value pack renters, certainly in, in um, maybe, maybe in a broader political context, but that particular label is a little bit judgmental. So that's sort of a long way to answer your question. I think if we don't start thinking about the political consequences of this kind of lack of collectivity, right? Like the fact is, the categories we've been arranged into by algorithms are not self-identified. And so therefore you're creating, there's no collective. And so there's no action that follows from that collective. And so that speaks to a real political problem. And this actually is part of the reason why I think we all feel like data subjects a lot, like subjected to, as opposed to data stakeholders, because we are that. Like we're very important in the in the process of datification. That was uh, that was wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, the, certainly there there are other books that have been written about um, about data, right? Uh, but I think part of what makes this book unique is this focus on the human rights angle, right? Um, so. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between human rights and data. Yeah, um, I I think that was, in a way, that was a, the biggest challenge in this book because a lot of times when you hear about human rights and AI or human rights and tech, people talk about privacy. They talk about freedom of expression. And those are the two most common, or you know, I, this idea of surveillance, which is tied to to privacy, and. I just don't think that that actually covers the human rights changes or even harms from datafication. So, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, human rights were founded for a reason, right? And or multiple reasons. And so as, as in IR, we tend to think about the quote beginning of global human rights from 1948. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that came about at the end of World War II. And that, that document started the legal framework that we now have this expansive legal framework of nine UN level human rights treaties, a ton of proposed human rights and human rights declarations that exist outside of the sort of hard law structure that we have. So, so we have dozens and dozens of rights. And if if what I said before about the datification of life is is true, you know, in the sense that our lives are shifting because of the fact that they're become the, our activities are becoming data, then how is it that it only affects these two things like privacy and freedom of expression? So one of the things I wanted to really establish is that there the entirety of our human rights framework is being challenged by datification, and so how you know. You know, one option is to go through every single human right and dem and write this out, right? And I, I thought that wasn't a very effective way to, to think about it because there are things about AI. It's a rapidly developing technology. There are things that are they're coming out that you know I can't anticipate. And even as I was writing this book, things changed after I turned in the final manuscript. So this this sector is moving too fast for someone to have that kind of like useful and meaningful analysis of these different various you know articles and and rights that we have. Um, in the UN system. So I kind of look back at my, you know, I've been working on human rights for a really long time and thinking about, okay, there was, there were reasons for the human rights framework to arise when it did. And it came about at a certain historical period. There were predecessors before, but none of them were universal, right? None of them were about a globally applicable framework for protecting what we see as human potential. And so, so I looked at you know the the history of the UDHR, and I and I thought okay well the, there are four values that are actually identified 
that undergird the entire rationale for human rights, right? That's um, dignity, autonomy, community, and equality. I sort of changed a couple of the words because originally community was known as brotherhood. I thought that was a bit antiquated. And also the idea of liberty, um, I, I sort of shifted to autonomy because I wanted to highlight agency. Like that's the point, right? We can we can act uh, more or less freely in the world or at least uh, more, more unencumbered than, than less. Um, and so I think those are the values, autonomy, dignity, equality, community that are being challenged by data and datafication. And, you know, I, I think often we treat data from people as though they're garbage, the way that they're talked about, or dust, or di digital detritus. And, or, you know, and th that's sort of one way to objectify data that come from people. And the other way is to call data as valuable as oil, right? So it has, but these are all market-driven ways to think about data that are coming from living human beings. And so this, you know, uh, once I sort of thought through the values of human rights, I thought, well, this is just datafication is an affront to human dignity from the outset. And that sort of led to my my way of thinking about human rights and data. And, and in the subsequent chapters, I sort of walk through how different things that have arisen from AI or datafication are really challenging autonomy, dignity, equality, and community. So one of kind of building on that, one of the things that you um, discuss in the book is that one of the ways in which data may um, uh, kind of implicate human rights um, has to do with the stickiness of data. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of what you mean when you talk about sticky data or the stickiness of data. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so the data stickiness is a, an important part of thinking about the challenge of datafication to human rights. So, you know, we can't, the, the, the people who made the UDHR and all the subsequent um, human rights frameworks really until the past 10 years, I would say, did not really anticipate this world of AI and data. And that's okay, right? So everything that we really understand about human rights entitlements have to do with our physical life, lives and the, our physical experiences. They don't have to do with any of the data that are being generated about our activities. And that doesn't mean that human rights don't apply in an age of data. In fact, I think they apply even more because our, our you know, we continue to live physical lives, but the experience of those lives has, has changed a lot from data. And data actually poses a few challenges to human rights. And, and in general, I would say the characteristics of, of data are, are challenging um, beyond human rights because they're as I say in the book, sticky. And so when I when I say data are sticky, I mean like data as sticky like gum that you step on at the bottom of your shoe. So often you're not even aware that you've stepped on it, but it's really hard to get rid of once you do. And that's really what I think about as data with regard to data about our activities. So they're sticky for four reasons. The first reason is that data are extremely mundane. They're every day. So the kinds of things that are being uh, collected about our activities are things that we often can't even avoid, right? So if you wear an Apple Watch, you know, there's data now exists about your heartbeats and how much you walk and whether you're riding a bike or sitting down. I mean, these things, you know, so these very mundane things, like think about those of us who live in big cities, um, when you ride public transit, every time you tap in, like you probably can't avoid that. You can't avoid your commute, your, your phone, if you have your phone in your pocket, it knows that you've gone to work or at least gone to a building you go to every day, right? So it's these sorts of things that are unavoidable. So first, that's what makes data, datafication um, mundane. It's like one of the reasons is that it's mundane. The second reason is that once the data are formed, once they're created out there in the world, they're, they're linked to other data. So data don't just sit nicely in an Excel spreadsheet somewhere. They're actually out there being traded and and moved around and combined with other data for analytical clarity. And so, so data are linked. And that leads to the third reason why they're sticky. It's because, because of this linkedness and because we don't really know where data go once they're created, I think it is most efficient for us to assume that they're effectively immortal. They're forever. And that's because even if some, someone says something is deleted, you can never actually make sure, you can't 
like actually verify the deletion of data. And so, so data are, are effectively forever. And the last reason I, I talk about data stickiness, and this one actually is, um, I think a, a very political concept, is thinking about the co-creation of data. And what I mean by that is this distinction between the data source, so that's all of us who are doing our, our mundane activities, and data collectors. These are the app creators, the, dev the device creators who are interested in our behaviors and our activities. And they're tracking those behaviors and activities. They're creating data out of them. So if you lack the data collector, because data don't exist in nature, you don't have data about people. But if you lack the sources, you also don't have data about people, right? So together in this sort of partnership, we co-create data about people and we co-create this world of datafication. And I think that's really important to note that um, it poses problems for thinking about rights claims over data but it also, I think, strengthens the argument in the book that we should be data, we should think of ourselves as data stakeholders because we literally have a stake in the creation of data. We are critical to that. And rather than thinking of, of ourselves as, you know, having these data collection processes and being subjected to them, I think we should be thinking about ourselves as more active participants in the process because we are. It's a very compelling, very powerful argument. Um, so I wanted to ask you about data rights. Uh, I immediately, when I saw the title of the book, I thought to myself, well, human rights and data, the, the right to be forgotten. That's the, sort of the, the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, and so I, I wondered if you, uh, if you would mind uh, reflecting a little bit on this idea of data rights. I, one of the alternative ways I could have written this book was to apply human rights to make a claim for data, to allow people to claim, quote, their data. And But as I thought about this more, as I started understanding the technologies better, what I realized is that when people say things like my data or your data, they're not being accurate because it's data about you, but it's actually, as I said, with the co-creation reality, it's not, you don't actually, you're not alone in making those data. So on the one hand, it just, it creates a real issue when you think about the distribution of ownership. And, and that's really, you know, something that's, that um, has a direct link to human rights. When we think about property rights, it's also one that's familiar in other realms of our, our societies. When we think about copyright, for example, right? To, to whom does this creative work belong? Unfortunately, data about people are not net, are not often, in fact, legal scholars don't think of them as creative because they're mundane. So, you know, it's your heartbeats are not reflective of some active, uh, active creation, right? You didn't do anything to enhance that. So there's no copyright, even though data about us is intensely personal. Um, and, you know, how do you because data are sticky, because they're effectively forever, um, it's really hard to think about them as property, like a, a house or a car or land or, you know, like what is it that's moved and how do you track it? Um, you know, there are others who, who are out there who thinking who think that we should be able to commodify uh, data about us. And in fact, we should be able to earn money from the data about us. I mean, first of all, that the money that is being earned is quite nominal, at least in, in the developed world. You know, it's very low numbers. And maybe that's beside the point, uh, because I don't actually think that helps in thinking about our humanity vis-a-vis -vis data, right? Which is to say that that assumes that the data being collected should be collected. And the best we can do is claim it by monetizing it and giving it some sort of value so that we feel compensated. That's a very market-driven way of thinking about human life. And it's one that I actively resist as a human rights scholar because there are other aspects of life that are not covered by, by the market. So how does the fact that data about us exist out there change our social relationships? How does it change our political relationships? And, and the practice of you know, our cultures, they change you know, over because of data as well, because of AI. And one of the things that you, you know, you raised the right to be forgotten and, and people have clung on to that, I think in, in certain circles at least, because it's, a, I, and I can understand that. It's this idea that if there's information out there about you that is 
not accurate or outdated or slanderous, libelous, you can ask for it to be removed, right? Um, because it's about you, it's about your identity. In practice, however, that right is actually controlled largely by corporations. So usually it's about Google searches. And so, you know, if you want to exercise your right to be forgotten, you tell Google that I want this link removed. I want this hidden from search uh, search results. And so that that's sort of a, an issue that we, you know, that'll come up again later in the book because it really puts a lot of political power in the hands of corporations and not other other um, institutions we have in society like governments to protect this right. But also I think um, it's really limited, right? It's also, it's unequal. Like you have to actually know how to exercise your right. You have to like, uh, like, you know, potentially go through a lot of Google searches to figure out how many of those are inaccurate. It speaks to, you know, the, the other side, which is our public right to know things like just because you don't like something written about you, but maybe it has political or, or public effects on other people. So how do you weigh the public need to know with this idea that you personally do not like something or you do not think it's true? And so there's not that really that kind of public adjudication around that at all. So when we think, and that's one way that one can claim rights over, quote, their data. But again, I think that's a really imperfect way to do it. It assumes that the data ha has a, you know, we should be creating, creating the data to begin with when I think, given a human rights framework, if the data are an assault to our autonomy, our dignity, or these equality concerns, at the very least, we should be pausing and thinking about whether those data ought to exist to begin with. Um, so you have in the book a chapter that's specifically about facial recognition technology. So how, how does facial recognition technology fit into all of this? I think there's so many ways to think about this because, um, you know, we all have a face. It's very important to our personal identity, to our social identity. And, you know, in, especially in democracies, this is something that is very much part of being a participant, right? And so, so I think that, that is something that's very key. I mean, we can also talk about just as a species, biologically, we're tuned to faces. So we know this is a really important thing for, for humanity. When we think about facial recognition technology, so what facial recognition technology does is it takes, depending on the algorithm, you know, it'll take a series of measurements from a picture of someone's face and then note those, right? They create a matrix. And then how this is used is you put in data about one person's face and you run it against a data set of a lot of other facial data to get matches, predictive matches. Okay? So that's really where this is. And it's a human rights issue for a number of reasons. Um, how, how facial recognition or FRT is used is often in violation of human rights. So if you look at some of the cases where police have used facial recognition, they have used it, all, not the systems themselves may or may not violate any rights, but the way that police and other law enforcement agencies use the technology is chock full of bias and discrimination. So that's one, one set of problems with FRT. The other I think is this question of whether a face or facial data are private? Is this a privacy issue? And because faces are actually socially useful and they're, they're not public, but they're social, right? We, we use them to interact with other people. I think this is a real challenge to say that this is a privacy issue. Now it feels icky. It definitely feels icky, um, but icky may not be privacy. And I actually like to think about facial data as a dignity issue, as an autonomy issue. Um, as an equality issue. And the reason for that is, you know, we're taking something that is fundamental to each and every one of us, our face, making that into data, and then treating it as though it's a commodity, as though we should be able to take those data and widely spread those data around in various data sets to, for good or bad, for good or bad outcomes, right? Either, you know, we can talk about um, the use of facial recognition and, you know, matching, um, you know, criminality, like predicting criminality, or or we talk about in terms of getting jobs, you know, there are a lot of ways that FRT are being used. But I think this is 
we have to ask whether these are those activities are reflective of, of dignity of treating people as though they have worth and i don't i don't know if that is i, I don't know if you know using frt for police purposes or employment purposes really treats human beings as though they have dignity but that's that's something that we could you know that's a discussion for for people to have i mean also if you think about frt it, it curtails autonomy there are private organizations so uh various stores use frt to, to predict whether someone's going to shoplift um madison square garden uses frt to screen out people they don't want accessing the building for various reasons these are curtailings of human autonomy of our individual autonomy and our choices and finally i think just to think about equality we know that human beings you know, we have, we discriminate, we have biases against certain types of people, certain groups of people. And it it is going to be reflected in the way that we use FRT, which is, you know, faces do tell us a lot about people, right? And so if you're, if you're already a, a you know, biased person, and we all have biases, and you sort of use this, this technology that really takes advantage of you know, facial uh, differences, you're gonna, they're equal, they're already equality concerns here. We know that marginalized communities disproportionately have, are, are you know, use, have FRT used against them, are, are showing up in these data sets for, for predicting someone's criminality. So um, I think, I think that there are a lot of ways to think about FRT and human rights. I'll, they're not easy to pinpoint though, with our existing human rights framework. And that's what the chapter is actually really about. It's about, how it is that something like FRT can feel so invasive and so challenging to our identities as, as individual human beings, and yet privacy is not capturing that. Right? It's not exactly a privacy issue. And so how do we make it a human rights issue when one of the, the seemingly most applicable human rights doesn't actually apply that well? Something else that the book addresses is um, you know, this, <laughs> this tension between the fact that it, human beings die but data about them can live on, right? Um, so I, I wondered if you could comment on that issue. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so I so actually this book started with the FRT chapter and with the the what I call the death chapter, right? The really morbid one. <laughs> so um, because I found it real at first, I found it really creepy, which I think a lot of people probably that's the response. It's it's creepy if the data are out there after we die. What what can happen? If, um, you know, when we're gone in terms of all the data that are out there that are created, what is it that's going to happen? And, you know, one of the things that people have done is they've tried to recreate people um, who have died or who haven't there. You know, you can also recreate people who are alive using data about them. So either, you know, get, take just gathering data about people or actually having volunteers, you know, who participate in, in sort of this recreation, this digital recreation. And there are so many ways, again, to think about human rights in this regard. I, I think one of the major things is, you know, typically, historically, when people die, they exit the human community, right? They're no longer with us. We mourn them, we mourn the loss, we miss them, but we know that they are not no longer actively in our everyday existence. What can happen now, though, with thanks to AI and thanks to datafication, is that you could um, reconstruct, you know, your your dad, your friend, at least in some way through the use of data that they generated in their lives. So one of the examples I use is of this tech entrepreneur named Roman Mazarenko. He died very young in an, a tragic accident, um, and his friend, who was also a tech entrepreneur. Um, decided to take all the texts they had shared, got texts from other people who were willing to share, and essentially cre recreated Roman as a bot. And, you know, by using his own words he had in life. So, you know, this not only is Roman, you can, you know, text Roman, he's still part of the, the group. So that's a community question. But it's also, there's a question of autonomy there, right? Which is, would Roman have wanted that? I mean, I think on the one hand, it's a very sweet gesture, you know, when you think about the depth of that friendship 
and and maybe for other people as well it was a way to sort of reconcile with themselves the fact that he had died so young and so tragically on the other hand what do you no, we don't know what he would have wanted um and maybe going forward there are ways for people to opt into these things and in fact there are um companies that allow for that um so in the book, I talk about Hereafter AI. That's a, an AI company that um, where you can actively actually record things for your loved ones to um, refer back to when you're dead. So that's, you know, that's that's another way to think about it. But I, I also think there's just this term, like, what is the difference? I guess what the possibility of being able to recreate someone out of the data they generated also raises a lot of questions about discretion, right? Which is that we all have lots of different aspects of our lives. And I can, you know, if you've ever been in a faculty meeting, you probably speak differently than if you're in, you know, later in the office with your close colleagues or at home, you're gonna be talking differently. It's, that's discretion, right? Every human being potentially has that ability. Some of us are better than others at being discreet and exercising discretion, but nonetheless, people make choices, right? So, you know, you don't talk the same way with your, your wine club as you do with your parents, right? So what I, I think what this, what happens though with data, it's, it's just there. And unless someone's actively tagging those data to replicate that kind of discretion that we would have exercised when we were alive, the potential for misrepresentation and just simply nonsensical responses is quite high. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know if everyone has, you know, the kind of discretion that maybe the friends of Roman did when they created the chatbot to, to make it sound like he, it did when he was alive. I think that there's so much potential for, for misrepresentation and, and, you know, likely, uh, shifts in the way we remember someone when they're gone that really fundamentally change the human experience. Um, so the book also deals with the governance of data. Uh, so let me ask you, how would you characterize the way that data are governed globally? I, I mean, I don't think they are really. I mean, right. I mean, that's the problem is we don't have a good way to think about how to govern data. And this is actually stuff that I'm working on now. So that's come out of the book, but just like in brief, I think, you know, right now the data are, are held by the data collector. So, you know, there are, there, you know, there are laws out there, regulations that try to rebalance that. So the EU's general data protection regulation, the GDPR is one of these that tries to insert data rights for data sources. So this idea of data portability, for example, where you can move data about you from, from place to place, um, that you can have things expunged. You know, that's really great. In, in some ways, it sort of repeats the things that are already, already out there. And it gives this extra like claim that people can, can actually somehow grab data about them and shift it. I think what's missing from a lot of the data governance, um, a lot of, from data governance are, are a couple of things. So one is that it assumes that the data ought to be created. So we don't have a lot of governance around data minimization. And, and this is an idea that, you know, only the data that we need should be collected, not the data that we want or that's possible. And right now, all the data that are possible to be collected are typically collected because you can. And so this idea of data minimization is really important. How do you enact that? I think you need a reason, you need justification. And I do think the human rights framework, the, you know, these values I've been talking about of dignity, autonomy, equality, and community, that would be a really good justification for thinking about data minimization, right? So if collecting the data can at some point hurt someone's dignity, we shouldn't collect it, right? So something like that. So one is that we don't have a good, we don't have regulation around what the sort of the quantity of data that are being collected. I think the other thing that's really missing from data governance is thinking about um, the collective and the individual. So most data governance out there is about how um, data are individual, 
right? So individuals consent, individuals make decisions. Unfortunately, the way that data are used, even though they're collected from individual people, what makes them useful is that they're pooled. And so data are actually about collectivities as much as they are about individuals. And frankly, the value of any individual's data is negligible without the other, other people's data and without the therefore collective implications or inferences that can be drawn. So I think that, you know, working towards this idea of thinking that data don't belong to any, they, data don't belong to any one person because they're co-created, but also excessively focusing on individual claims to those data actually, it actually sort of hides the fact that the only reason these data matter is because of the collective. And in fact, there are collective effects of, of datafication that are being missed. And so, you know, the EU is, is sort of moving on this. They're, they're recognizing that there are collective claims to data um, in, their, in their, AI, their most recent AI, um, some of the AI legislation. But I think more needs to be done with this. And I think that we, the way that data are framed is, are, is very consistent with a, an individualistic thinking, um, which makes sense because of how data are being collected about all of our activities, but it doesn't actually capture why data are important. And, and actually, if we start thinking about data's collective implications, then you know, social sciences naturally have things to say about, about that. So, yeah. One of the challenges to this governance question, as I understand it from your book, uh, has to do with the fact that, you know, you, usually when we think about human rights, we think about sort of individuals making claims against their governments. But when we talk about data, that, you know, datification is being done predominantly by corporations, right? Um, and you uh, talk uh, quite a bit about Facebook and uh, Meta. Uh, so I wondered if you wanted to expand a little bit uh, about that, about sort of the, the, the challenge that's posed by the fact that these are corporations predominantly that are uh, um, that are collecting this data. I'm glad you raised this because you know often when we think about human rights, um, the part about the state gets left out because I think I think that when people think about um, human rights, they they I think they are they're they're um, attracted by the values that are inherent in human rights and, and not thinking about, oh, these only apply when states either deny my exercise of rights or when I can make claims against the state. So I think you're absolutely right to bring this up and, and I'm glad to talk about it because this is, I think, a fundamental limitation right now in the way we think about human rights. Um, so, so, you know, r states are responsible for human rights under the international legal framework and businesses must respect human rights. But that really leaves the onus on states to do the enforcement and the, you know, the sort of facilitating the enjoyment of human rights. That's really what that means. And I think it just does not reflect in reality. And as you said, you know, companies are doing the datafication. Companies are also owners of the platforms where we exercise some of our, our human rights. Um, you know, I just, again, the pandemic, thinking about educational platforms, right? How, how people had to learn online. But in general, you can think about platforms like, um, you know, Facebook or Instagram, um, which are meta properties or, or Twitter or whatever. Like these are places where decisions are made about the, con uh, about the whether something should be posted or not, which affects people's freedom of expression. Um, and often these are, you know, companies follow their own sets of standards with regard to this. There's no way to really, inf to, to make, you know, Facebook, you know, post something or rescind something um, from, a, from a legal framework anyway. And I think that this is increasingly an untenable distinction between business respect versus, you know, government responsibility or state responsibility to enforce human rights. Because frankly, we're exercising our rights um, and, and the, the, how our rights are being, um, what affects our exercise of rights on a daily basis is not necessarily the state anymore. In fact, many times what's, what's affecting our exercise of rights is, is uh, private, private, privately owned platforms. So one 
so so that's that's all well and good and i think you could say well co you know companies aren't making efforts to actually govern human rights they just incidentally are there they're providing products that people can use to exercise their rights and i think that's perhaps often true but it's increasingly less true so in the book i looked at the oversight board of that facebook and now meta have um, it was started when the company was still known as Facebook. And the idea behind this oversight board is basically get a bunch of experts to evaluate decisions on either the takedown or the posting of, of um, different content that, that users have. And so this board actually evaluates cases, sort of acts like a court, evaluates cases that come before it and makes a binding decision on whether it should be reposted or removed. And that is a way to adjudicate the exercise of freedom of expression. It also is explicitly part of the oversight board's mission. It's to, you know, to uphold freedom of expression, to think about how freedom of expression can be expressed on, on Meta's uh, platforms. And so the oversight board looks at both Facebook and, and Instagram postings. I mean, this is important because Meta affects now almost 4 billion people around the world. When I was writing, first writing the book, it was about 3 million, a billion, excuse me. Now it's closer to 4 billion. That's more than any, uh, bigger, a bigger population than any government can credibly claim to, to govern. Um, and so if we don't think about how important Meta is for the you know, freedom of expression, and now they have an explicit body that that somewhat regulates what happens on its platforms. I think we're really missing something about how companies have become, you know, in, in political science parlance, governors, right, exercising governance powers, which is, you know, determining order and, and creating shared expectations. That's what governance is about. That's what, uh, you know, the oversight board does. That's what all these various social media platforms are doing. Um, and now, we, now you know, we, we're seeing Meta pulling out of news, right? They're not no longer going to spread news, spread information. They have huge reach globally, and the refusal to to engage with news is a really important part of not just freedom of expression. Like not knowing the news is prevents people from exercising their freedom of conscience. It prevents people from, you know, exercising their freedom to to associate and assemble if they don't have information to, to act on. And so we can think about these huge consequences that that um, these platforms have for our lives. And I would say that they're governing big aspects of our, our existence, not existence, not just in terms of information, but just engagement in in modern life. But we don't really recognize that. And, and I think it's, it's time to really think about how businesses in the process of doing business might have more than just respect for human rights. We might want them to actually be responsible in, in some way that's, that's uh, commensurate with, with their effect on our exercise of human rights. So the book also has a, a chapter with an amazing title <laughs> where um, uh, data literacy or why we need libraries, not Twitter. Uh, so I want to ask you about uh, the argument you make in this chapter for considering data literacy as a human right. Uh, will you tell us about that? One of the goals I had in writing this book, which this chapter kind of violates, is not declaring a separate right. <laughs> I did. So, you know, there's there there's a bill of AI rights out there that the U.S. government has proposed. There are people out there who've been talking about how we need an AI bill of rights or a digital bill of rights for quite some time now. And I reject that because it's sort of it creates a I think an arbitrary distinction between our physical lives and our digital lives. I mean, they're very intertwined. So, so shouldn't they, shouldn't our lives or shouldn't the rights just take into account what can happen in a digital context in addition to a physical context? And because they're intertwined, it doesn't make sense to have different bills of rights or sets of rights. And I ended up breaking that because I think by the end of the book, um, one of the things that really occurred to me was that one of the reasons why um, we think about AI the way we do, uh, datafication has happened the way it has, is because we're not data literate. As a, I mean, you know, as societies, we're not data literate. And, and that's because most people don't deal in data on a daily basis, at least before. 
So, you know, if I was talking 20 years ago, most people don't deal in data every day. Now all of us are dealing in data every day. We just don't think about it that way, but it's actually happening. So when I talk about data literacy, one, I try to ground it in the right to education, to just say this should be part of the right to education. It doesn't make sense in the 21st century to, to try to um, help ensure the right to literacy if people aren't also being educated in, in data. So that's really where the logic is. But what I mean by data literacy is not everyone should be a data scientist. That's data expertise, right? So what I mean by data literacy is kind of like what we mean by other literacies. So, you know, when we talk about reading and writing, when we talk about numeracy, we're talking about basic conceptual understandings and some basic skills, but basic conceptual understandings of what words do, why we need words, what are numbers, what are they representing, and what kinds of things can I do with this kind of knowledge? And I think that's the same with data. What are data? You know, we, we started this conversation where I pointed out that, you know, data aren't free, they're, they're not freely existing, they have to be created. I think that's something really important to keep in mind and to know that data are analog as well, because I think sometimes I say data to people and they go, whoa, you know, like, scary computer zeros and ones. And, and it's important to know that data, we create data on a daily basis without thinking about it because data are used to classify the world. And if we think about every, every place we walk into, every situation we're in, I think a lot of us implicitly just take stock of what's happening, what's going on, what, you know, where am I, who are the people in here? What kind of behavior should I, should I be, you know, evincing? So I do think that data literacy is something that's really critical for engaging. And it's the building block for other types of literacy. So sometimes people talk about media literacy. How do you adjudicate between different sources of information that both seem legitimate? Well, it would help to know a little bit about data. It would help to know about how the, the story came to your, you know, your feed. It's based on some algorithmic analysis of your previous behavior, your previous choices. So it could help people become more, more skeptical of what they're being exposed to, especially now in an age where the technology, you know, AI, generative AI is creating all sorts of realities, quote unquote, that are that are computer generated, right? That are not physically physically ref, uh, reflective of physical reality. So I think data literacy is useful for also thinking about the biases that are inherent in data, not just in algorithms, which is how we tend to think about biases in AI, but actually data themselves are biased. And if we know something from social science is bad data in, bad data out, right? Bad outcomes, bad output. So it's really important to know how the data are biased. And I, was, I was just in a talk yesterday with a colleague who was showing visual data. So like photographs and how um, computer vision can't see certain types of things. So we've trained computer vision to see buildings of a certain type, skyscrapers, things we see in the West, right? Uh, certain types of houses, certain types of dwellings. You take that computer vision out of this context and you ask it to look and to see other types of dwellings in other societies. And they don't, they literally don't see them. It's, it's, they don't even label them as anything. They're just quote, nothing, right? And so understanding that, that there is bias in data because data are human creations. I think that is such a fundamental concept and way to think. And as we go forward, knowing that we're all gonna be engaged in the data process, either as data collectors or as data sources, I think data literacy is paramount for, for having, for actually meaningfully having the right to education. Well, Wendy, there's so much more that we could discuss uh, with the book, but we've taken up so much of your time. Um, so I just wanna thank you for being on the show today. Oh my gosh, thank you, Lamise. This is wonderful. The book is Wendy Wong's We the Data, Human Rights in the Digital Age, published by the MIT Press in 2023. Thank you for listening.